Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joel C. Hunter. Well, that was such a sparkling introduction that uh, I fear opening my mouth and ruin it, uh, ruining it all. Um, first of all, let me, let me say how honored I am to be here. And... Uh, I'm on a very steep learning curve when it comes to uh, Iran. Um, we have people in my congregation from Iran. Um, I love the country, um, but I am well aware of my own ignorance and my own inexperience. And so um, I really didn't come here to speak. I came to learn. And I have uh, dearly loved all the presentations so far. Uh, they've been very valuable. Um, I, I, I want to say I'm, I am, uh, by the way, who, was it Brasa that, that said he's our conscience? Well, who just said that? Yes. You know, I've always wondered what my conscience looks like. <laughs> and now I know. I never pictured it like you. But, I, but now I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm so tickled also with that the White House has sent two representatives, although this last one. Do you realize how, how young this, I've got, I've got things in my refrigerator older than this girl was. <laughs> but uh, but, but I'm, they, they really do, um, um, they really are um, concerned um, and engaged with the future of Iran. And I'll, and I'll say just a few words and then, then I'll be glad to, to uh, do some question and answer. That this talk is taking um, place over a, uh, lunchtime um, is symbolic of an element of dis diplomacy that is often deemed secondary, but in the long run is central. And that is personal conversation and familiarity. Uh, this is the very dynamic that is needed um, between our countries, but it doesn't happen between countries. It happens between people. Uh, it happens in personal conversation. A few years ago, as I was meeting with uh, um, some of the leaders of Iran, and we were, we were talking, there was a, we, we have an ongoing through, um, especially the leadership out of uh, Catholic University, um, Ayatollah Erevani, uh, Professor Robert Destro, um, uh, Marshall Brieger, um, the, the Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Abrahamic approach um, has been having ongoing dialogue for 10 years uh, with the leadership in Iran. And, uh, and we were talking about um, the, um, the nuclear negotiations back then. Um, and, and someone put their finger on the, on, the, on the problem. It was just mentioned in the last session. Um, we really can't make progress without trust. And we don't trust each other. Um, and the only way that's going to be changed is through familiarity and relationship. That's the only way that happens. Um, and, and, you know, last night we heard this, this, this very accurate calculation of the diplomatic demands and counter demands that must be made for successful negotiations to conclude in a treaty. Um, it was almost steely. It was so mechanical. It is necessary that those, that kind of clarity be dealt with. But, but as we go on, and just as, as someone who's, who's worked in the public sector and, and the private sector for a very long time, it's not just a matter of how to. It's a matter of want to. It's a matter of do I want this to happen? And why would I want it to happen? You know, yesterday uh, also, we got a very good typology uh, of the difference between public influence and, and, and private relationships um, and, and, and what you're looking for in each. Um, and and there, there was a very clear differentiation, uh, differentiation as to how, be, how to be the most effective political persuader you can be. Um, and... And I loved it because 
Because many times, and you know this, and this is just as in true in Iran as it is in the United States, domestic politics will sabotage international aspirations. Um, they have to fight a hard right just like we do. Um, and, and, so, and so our voices being raised in an effective manner is the business of NIAC. It's, it's, what, it's, it's part of why you're here. But again, just from the old guy, I want to take us to a different level, a relational level, um, a matter of what is true over uh, um, cultures over time. And that is that we must establish the kind of ongoing dialogue that makes diplomacy possible. We don't start with diplomacy. We start with dialogue. We start with very specific conversations with very specific people, and that not all about the issue, about our families, about our situations. Um, um, I thought it was very good when, when somebody said, when you walk into uh, um, a, a, a congressman's office, um, don't start with your philosophy. Don't lecture them. Tell them about your personal situation, because that's the most engaging thing of all. That gives them the want to. Um, to find the how-to. Now, I'm an eternal optimist, and so I'm, I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna note a few things that are kind of in our favor for significant progress um, in the near-term future. First of all, Providence would have it that um, we have two administrations who were elected because they wanted to include outsiders, or they were more open to including outsiders. There's a window of time uh, that they'll still be in there and that they have not changed uh, character. Uh, in 2000, July 2007, Senator Obama, then Senator Obama, uh, gave me a call, and, and this was our conversation. Um, he said, tell me how you think that faith communities and other nonprofit organizations, by the way, Faith communities are never sectarian um, um, in these conversations. It's not your faith community. It is all faith communities and communities that may not be faith-based, but they're just as charitably oriented. And so they're human-based. And that's, when I say faith communities, that's, that's the inclusion here. Um, but let's talk for a while about how um, those communities can partner with the government to solve the problems of this nation and of the world. We had the most delightful conversation for about a half an hour on the phone, um, just give and take. Um, and, and that was kind of the beginning of our, of our relationship. Um, and that was kind of the reason uh, for our relationship. That has not changed. This man has not changed. Last week, there was a... Um, um, a memorandum to all the heads of, of all U.S. agencies to create regional civil society innovation centers, uh, a number of them uh, starting throughout the world, to specifically engage civic leaders in those communities to partner in solving the problems of those communities. That has not, his, his character, his goals have not changed one iota despite the frustrations uh, of operating within a political, um, politically limited, limited uh, uh, setting. Um, and so I say that to kind of piggyback on the enthusiasm of Stephen when Stephen first got up here. Man, was I pumped. I didn't even know what I was pumped about, but it was like, holy cow, this guy's excited. I think I am too. And I say that to, to just say this is, there is no more valuable coalition than this kind of coalition to do exactly what you're trying to do, and that is to tell a personal story of personal truth that government needs in order not to relapse into a mechanical kind of categorical approach um, to problem solving. The second hope I, 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 I know that we have um, comes out of my conversations with and my visit to Iran um, and its leaders. Um, I cannot tell you um, how deeply, um, uh, the word deeply in love, you, you got to understand, 
when I, when I have an affinity towards something, there's no middle gear with me. I just kind of love it, you know? <laughs> and I feel like that with a run. I, I, um, there, there are, I realize that all of this is tricky. Uh, all of this is ephemeral. Um, um, and when it gets down to the real details, uh, it, it, gets, um, it gets problematic. But overall, and that's where I want to stay, I want to stay at the 50,000 foot level. Um, our, our recent delegation went there for a conference on how to reduce religious extremism and violence. That was, that was why we were together. Um, and we were problem solving together. But we were not just problem solving, we were creating the long term networks of relationships that are needed to do just that. Because you will not, never reduce it by argument. You will never reduce it by force. Um, you will only reduce it uh, by the kinds of relationships and the kinds of networks that provide something better. I was so impressed with the Shia approach uh, to Islamic um, 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 devotion. It was no less devoted but somewhat more vetted than, um, than many approaches to religion. Uh, I can tell you as an evangelical, um, we, don't, we don't have a pope, we don't have a, a huge hierarchy, we just kind of go straight to scripture and then try to do what it says. Um, that's problematic without proper guidance, uh, without proper scholarship. Um, and one of the things I really appreciated was the level of conversation, the level of intellectual engagement um, because in those conversations were not just religious devotees. They were not just people who took divine revelation and tried to walk it out. They were logicians. I mean, uh, there was a professor of logic. Um, there were, they were the uh, scientists. Uh, they were the philosophers. Um, um, they were the thinkers um, who, who, who needed to plow through these things in a reasonable way rational approach. And, of course, you all know the history of Iran. This is, this is a country, a, a culture, really, unique in the Middle East, uniquely placed for just such a time as this, but unique in its history. One of the great um, 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 ancestors, great rulers we have in common is Cyrus. Cyrus is men mentioned 28 times in the Bible, always Complimentary, you know. Cyrus was this this leader, and the Syriac um, 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 what do you, uh, cylinder is still at the UN, still embedded in the UN. But here was a leader of Iran, and the culture, his culture is still there. That was for religious equality, um, for freeing the exiles, um, for a, a a rational approach to progress. Um, it, uh, it, it's just. That's the kind of culture, uh, and that's the kind of capability uh, Iran has that, by the way, everybody recognizes that knows anything about what's needed for the future. Um, there are a lot of people that react emotionally to the narrative of the moment, um, uh, to, the, to the talk show hosts and all of that kind of stuff, but those of us who are in a serious long-term solution um, mode knows that Iran is central to not only the region, but the whole world. And not only when it comes to um, peace, but prosperity as well, uh, because of the culture and the capability um, of the history. So therefore, number three, the emergency of the moment ISIS or ISIL, however you want to call it, is really doing us a favor. It's a painful favor. It's a horrible favor. But nonetheless, it's a favor. Because the enemy of my enemy, you know, makes for relationships that wouldn't ordinarily happen, makes for conversations that would not ordinarily happen, and elevates the aspects of solutions that may not be elevated beyond um, um, or makes evident the elements of solutions that may not ordinarily be, ele be elevated. Uh, President Obama has, has said, along with many others, 
There is no military solution to this problem. There is no military solution to this problem. It has to be one of dialogue, one of development, one of diplomacy. And so therefore, one of the first visits I had to the Oval Office, I, I, I don't want to run over my time here, um, was um, just after the election. Um, um, T.D. Jakes and I were in the Oval Office. Some of you know who T.D. Jakes is. He's an African-American, very popular preacher um, in, in the country. And he and I were sitting there talking with the president. And, and Bishop Jakes, and I know the president wouldn't mind me telling this because he's said this as many times, and others have said it in the Oval Office as well. But Bishop Jakes said, you know, what's the main um, sobering um, truth that you've learned uh, in your first days of office? And, uh, and, and President Obama didn't hesitate. And I can't quote him exactly. You're not supposed to quote, try to do that anyhow. But it was something to the effect of, if these problems had ready solutions, they never would have made it to the Oval Office. And, 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 and what that brings to mind is this. The importance is, the importance of what we're, what we're talking about can't be solved by an office. It can't be solved by any one political system. Peter Kreeft, who's a, who's a, a, a professor um, at Boston University, has written a number of books. Um, one of them, intriguingly entitled, Ecumenical Jihad. Um, and, and, and basically what he said was, God has this great habit of giving us problems so big that we've got to expand the boundaries in order to solve them because they can never be solved within the boundaries out of which they were created. And that's really the point, isn't it? That's really the favor we're seeing today. We all need each other. Um, uh, um, uh, not just um, nations, but, but uh, um, um, all the actors. Uh, Naeem has written a book, um, um, The End of Power. And the theme of that book, if you've not read that book, is that all of the traditional power brokers don't have the capability of solving problems that they used to. Um, I don't care what your office is in government, what corporation you're with, uh, what major denomination, what major religious set. They don't. There, there's all of these players popping up that also have part of the uh, part of the solution. And so, and so, to reiterate, one of the third great. Um, um, attribute or, or the, the third great blessing, if you would let me relapse into my religious language, um, is, is the general awareness that there is no one group that can solve the problems of the world. Uh, we, the problems are so big, we have to work together. Um, and, and, and whether you're talking about environmental care or peace or, or um, poverty, or uh, Ebola, or whatever you're talking about, we need each other. And we have, I think, um, two administrations that are becoming more and more aware of that, if they can just get over kind of the political barriers uh, that are endemic uh, to, their, to their situation. And then the last thing, and you would, you would expect me to mention this, Religion is going to be a major, have a major role um, in the U.S.-Iranian um, um, relationship. Uh, we're both religious countries. Um, and, and I know that people keep talking about uh, the secularization of, of you know, um, uh, of power and so on and so forth. And, and, and all religions need to be mediated um, uh, so that no sect is given the power of government. That really includes Christianity. We tried that once. It really didn't work. Uh, with Constantine, you know, whenever, whenever, uh, whenever one of us is given the power of government, it tends to not include or tends to slowly exclude. You know, when, when Constantine came into government, he said, yeah, oh, yeah, all the pagans will have equal rights. But every... Every, Gibbons writes this in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, uh, every um, instance where there was a decision, 
somehow the Christians came out ahead and somehow the pagans didn't. Um, and so, so religion can be a terrible danger, but it can also be a significant part of the solution. Um, and, 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 and we need to remember that um, we are going to need to put together faith communities that cooperate, that respect one another. Um, President Obama, since he's been in office, has put a faith-based office in every major agencies, agency of government. Um, and they're active. And, and they know that unless you address the, 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 the religious question where, where the general population really operates from, you'll never solve a problem long term. Um, the, the Iran, of course, is the same way. They're religiously governed. Uh, and so any successful negotiation will go through um, um, the religious um, um, grid. Um, and, 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 and so that's just something that we have to, we have to deal with. We'll never be France. You know, in the French, uh, French Revolution, they basically expunged all religiosity from the public square. That will never be a part of this country, as, as, as far as I can see, of, as this, of this country or Iran. And so if you can't expunge it, you've got to, you've got to deal with it. You've got to, you've got to network it for the benefit of all the countries and all the world um, that, that, is, um, that can benefit. Um, just one last thing. When President Obama and I, 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 I communicate with President Obama every week, I send him devotions. Out of, devotions are little scriptures with little explanations. Um, uh, he, that's the way he starts every day. Um, and, and then periodically we pray together and, and you know, we have personal conversations and so on and so forth. We never talk politics. We never talk policy. Because what's really important, and I think we've heard it in, in what we've heard here, is not um, organized religiosity. What's really important is character and an accountability that is beyond one's own group. Uh, and a sense of somber responsibility that what we are about is important not only to the entire world, but to those of us who believe in God, to God. And that energizes us and gives us a, a much wider perspective than we would have uh, simply from our own political group, our own affinity group. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, <clears throat> I have to give a secular confession. Um, we rarely discuss religion at the NIA conferences. It's rarely been part of the conversation. I think it's a very welcome step to bring in this dimension as well. And, and there's three key things that I would like to touch upon before I uh, open it up to the, uh, the Q&A to the floor. First of all is that I recognize that my ability to be able to connect or reach a dimension of those inside Iran who belong to the very conservative wing of the government is very limited. At the same time, there's a clear recognition that they hold a very powerful veto on what can happen, on the many things that we would like to see happening, they hold a veto. Yet we have limitations to how we can connect, how we can get that personal relationship, get on their wavelength. And whatever our ability is, I'm sure your ability is far, far greater. And I would like to know how that connection has happened. I would like to know what that dialogue with them have been. And in particular, have you found through the religious discourse the ability to create common understanding on issues such as human rights, mm -hmm. an issue that I know, not in the, only in the case of Iran, but in many other cases, if you go from it from a value-based position, 
there is tremendous resistance because they take pride in having their own values and they don't necessarily believe that everyone should have the same values. But if you can find an inroad from the religious dialogue, have you seen any signs of it? Is there anything we can point to? Is it a process you think that could take X amount of years? What are your thoughts based on the experience you've had in dialogue with people in Qom? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I have seen um, a very significant um, result of our conversation uh, that is based on our mutual faith. Um, the Abrahamic religions, of course, uh, come from a common source. We all believe in one God. Um, and, and, and so we've been able to share. Um, and by the way, all of these dialogues help us to become better in our own faith. They don't water down or blur what we believe. They help us actualize what we believe. Um, but having said that, um, one of the conversations that we had, as, as um, Ali noted, was um, we were, and this is not the first conversation like this, um, but we uh, went and wanted to know how to most effectively address um, the imprisonment of Pastor Abedini uh, as well as some others who were being imprisoned there. Um, and they, these, these leaders, helped us um, in both the composition of the letter. Um, it was not on political grounds, it was on humanitarian and, and religious uh, compassion grounds uh, that we were asking for his release. They um, helped us guide it to the right one. You know, in America we go, well, I, we'll, take, we'll get it to the president, you know. Well, that, that wouldn't have done any good. Rouhani has nothing to do with his release. You know, it's a ju judicial system. Um, and so they help us guide it uh, to, the right one, uh, to the right person um, with the promise of being an advocate because of that relationship that we had. Uh, now, we know a lot of things can happen after those letters. You know, the vetting process of the letters uh, can get very complicated and do. But we felt befriended and we felt helped because of the relationship that we had built. Um, and, and, um, and so too, um, we want to be advocates for the, Iranian, uh, the, the Iranians in America that run into problems. And, and we want to use our relationships at least to get it to the right place, at least to get it with the right recommendation. Um, that says, um, listen, would you address this respectfully? Um, and I would appreciate any attention you could give to, give to it. So we felt that from them, um, and, and we, um, we promised the same in return. You mentioned that, um, that there's, so as an example of this, you mentioned that it's important to recognize, or there is a recognition increasingly, that these global problems are of such nature that no single country, no single group can resolve them themselves. Did you sense that there was a similar recognition, similar conclusion on the side of those religious elements inside of the Iranian government or Iranian elite that had come to that conclusion? And if so, how are they actualizing? How are they turning that into either policy or any type of action? Because we don't necessarily get that sense standing from far away. Yeah, I, I can't speak as to the policy or what, what comes from it because I, I, I don't have the, the follow-up. I can tell you the tone of the meetings is we're in this together. Uh, the tone of the meetings is because of our common faith values, uh, we need to work together. Um, in order to honor the God we, we believe in and in order to be compassionate to those who are being left out. Um, in the long run, and, and you all know this, all of us, number one, want to believe that, that we're doing something significant that really matters. And number two, that we are a respected partner. Um, and, and we give that to each other. Um, and, and so I do feel like there is not only going to be ongoing dialogue, as a matter of fact, it's, it's happened already for 10 years, um, but it will have concentric um, 
effects. Um, and, 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 and in this country, that's what needs to happen because we can change the politics slowly, laboriously, precisely, um, but we have to change the narrative for there to be any permanent change in this country. We have to change the understanding of who Iran is, um, uh, of, of, of how um, much there is to be gained uh, by loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And that's not just theology, that's reality, that's a joy. So, so when I come back and I go to the National Association of Evangelicals, you know, that's, how many, we, how many we got, 30 million members back? 30 million members. Um, and I can tell them about these conversations um, in Iran. When I go to, um, I'm part of the leadership of the World Evangelical Alliance, 600 million members. And I can tell them of these conversations that are happening. That changes in an instant. All of you know this, by the way. You don't, you don't really have a relationship unless you have updated information. You, many of you have been married for years. Um, unless you checked in with your spouse in the last couple of months, you're running on a roll. You're not running on an actual relationship because your spouse is in a different place than they were a couple of months ago. The same is true with countries. Only updated information can give you accurate enough information that you can actually have an intimate relationship. Um, and so when I come back and I say, guess, guess what conversations I just had? Um, and and um, that has a profound effect. So I'm talking too much. So, so on that note, actually, um, mindful of the misunderstandings that exist that tend to be mutual, the absence of contacts that has created a lot of voids. Some of those voids have been filled with fear rather than with information. When you came back in May, from Iran, having done a trip to, I believe, Esfahan, Tehran, mm -hmm. Rome. And you went to the Oval Office, and I, I understand um, we have to respect the integrity of the conversation you have with the President, but if you could share something with us, what was the one thing you think the President was most surprised by, your trip and your dialogue with those elements in Iran? Well, uh, first of all, we met with the team. There were a couple of us that just went to the West Wing, and we met with the team. Um, from the White House that um, is most engaged with the um, with the um, Iranian relationships and negotiations and so on and so forth. <laughs> we came back, of course, with a glow. I mean, we had just been in these wonderful conversations, um, deep appreciation realizing we were bordering on naive because you know you're very enthusiastic about a relationship and you want them to be more open more enthusiastic and then of course you run into and this is all institutional grids you run into this well you know that's great <laughs> You know, and so all we could do um, um, is, is tell them of our hopes, uh, recommend any actions um, that we could to uh, diminish um, the, um, the ineffective sanctions, um, the, um, tell them about what we believe uh, is not only an openness, but a genuine invitation uh, to have better relationships um, and, and, and then just kind of leave it at that. Um, but, but we came back with a good report and, and we think it will have an effect over time. I'm gonna open up to the floor for questions. I'm gonna to try to get as many people that I know haven't spoken yet, Tom. Uh, I was going to ask about the, the difficult sticking point of uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship and the, the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Um, you know, the, that issue for Iran for decades has been, you know, something that they've taken a strong position on and obviously 
a divergent position from the U.S. And you know, I know the the position of the evangelical community is not uniform on this issue. You know, but certainly um, large elements of the community have been, uh, I would argue, an obstacle to a solution there. So I was wondering if you could talk about whether or not that entered in the conversation, or um, if you foresee that happening. Um, it didn't happen um, uh, in much of this conversation. Again, part of, you all realize this, part of the value of meeting is not what happens in the meeting, but what happens in sidebar conversations. Um, that's, that's really why you go, is to have the sidebar conversations that you can't really address as a group. Um, and so that, that question came up you know, in one or two conversations, sidebar conversations, but it's such a um, um, explosive uh, topic that once you bring it up in a meeting, it just kind of, you know, sucks all of the oxygen out of the air. And so, no, we didn't talk about that um, in our meetings. We were very focused on what our countries could do together, um, um, not on any particular policies our countries had toward others. If I could do a quick follow-up on that. You mentioned that the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, or the entire Israel angle was explosive. But was human rights ex explosive as well? Was it a resistance from their end to talk about that issue in a religious context? That's a very good question. And, and no overt religious, uh, uh, resistance, I'm sorry. No one says, hey, we aren't talking about this. Uh, they, they listened. They took notes, um, they asked questions, and, and, and we gave, you know, our perspective. And, and uh, of course, we had attorneys there, and, uh, which is always fun, because they, they get into the actual cases. Well, where's the, you know, what's the, and, and you know, <laughs> preachers like me just kind of go, oh, okay, I, that, I'm out. Uh, but, but yes, there was engagement, um, and, and it seemed like there was genuine conversation. Um, and so we felt like at least something was addressed and, and uh, taken seriously. Faye in the back. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I want to ask you if you have suggested to, the, to President Obama to extend an invitation to some of the religious hierarchies in Iran to come for a visit. In the past, when President Khatami was the president, uh, I think some of the ministers at the Washington Cathedral uh, extend an invitation to him, and he had a wonderful uh, visit uh, at, at the U.S. Have you tried to do that? Uh, Actually, uh, President Rouhani just spoke at uh, the Washington Cathedral um, Friday night. Yeah, and so they've they've extended the same thing, you know, uh, to. It's not. Uh, yeah, two things. First of all, I don't. Uh, go to the president. Our, our, our relationship is a pastoral one. And so we talk about his spiritual life. We talk about his family. We talk about, we pray. Um, um, and my role as a pastor is just to help him get connected with God uh, and to feel the support of, 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 uh, of a spiritual um, advocate. Um, that being said, um, I'm called into meetings um, at his invitation. And when I'm called into meetings, then I can make suggestions. But I can't initiate suggestions simply because that, that wouldn't be appropriate within the boundaries of our relationship. That would, that would kind of spoil the relationship. Mahnaz. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I wonder if you have had any conversations um, as um, going back on what Trita is asking, uh, and I want to even take a further step and say um, about torture and um, in the context of piety, because they see themselves as pious men that are murdering and torturing the best and the brightest of the Iranians. So I'd like to know if you have ever approached that in the context of their piety doing that and where does that fit in that scope of religious and faith and God and all those kinds of things yeah. we're talking about. Thank you. Well, the, if I'm getting your question correctly, um, the, the reason 
or, or at least the, the central event of our visit to Iran was to speak against religious extremism and violence um, and to delegitimize um, the link of piety with violence and torture and, and, and other, um, other matters that, that none of us would claim, uh, none of us would, would see as a part of piety or devotion to our particular religions. Now, did it get to the stage of, well, then what about? Um, no. Uh, again, we're, this, is a, this, is a, this is a marathon, um, and we build incrementally. And the difference between a government negotiation for a treaty uh, and a long-term um, um, dialogue that hopefully results in a network of relationships that can provide the environment and will provide the environment to, for government to do what they need to do. Um, the, the second one takes longer um, and is a little bit more careful about inciting um, a, a, a negative reaction or m perhaps a relationship ending reaction. So it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a dance. It's kind of a dance. Um, and, and we're very careful about who goes. Um, there are people <laughs> who I would not want in those conversations uh, because they would be veins standing out in the neck and pointing and, and then nothing would get, get, get done. Uh, but by the same token, neither do we take over people who do not have the courage to bring up the areas of concern um, and readily admit that all of our religions um, have had um, um, fundamentalists that have taken it to places where it was not, um, where it would not be claimed as, you know, Islam. I mean, for Islam to be defined by ISIS would be like Christianity being defined by the KKK. You know, it just isn't, it's not something you do. Um, and so we distance ourselves from that and we try to, we try to create a much more positive, um, um, genuine um, representation of what we believe. You mentioned that um your hope is to be able to also become an advocate for Iranian Americans in this conversation. There's already a precedent set here in which people are sharing their emails on stage. I'm not going to push you that far, but can we count on the channels that you are creating to be able to address our concerns that perhaps the policymakers are not as able of addressing? to make sure that this very important angle is not lost in the larger conversation? Eventually. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to promise too much, um, uh, but yes, that's what we all want. That's, all of us want to know, first of all, who can most effectively address these concerns? Um, um, you know, you get a 20-something a month in her office, <laughs> And these very legitimate concerns. Now, I, th I think what I, what I heard was a very bright person who's very earnest about doing her job. And she will go back and she'll try to chase this down. But I can almost guarantee you, all of us know what big organizations are like and how many cracks there are to fall through. Um, and so um, as we develop these relationships, we've got to understand, first of all, which branch of government really addresses this um, and what department in that branch really addresses this. Um, and if we do that, if we can be successful in, in hearing enough of these, enough of these um, um, problems, um, I think we can get them solved because, because any signal 
from somebody just above you. Again, you all know this. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. You give a, a guy who makes, you know, um, I don't know, 10 bucks an hour a badge, and man, they're going to hit everybody with their baton, you know, because that's just what they do. <laughs> um, if, you, if you give that person, that guy or that gal, a, a, a mentor that says, no, we're here to help people. We're not here to embarrass people. We're not here to shame people. We're here to help people. This is our job. You'll get a, a totally different turnaround. But as you know, Nothing gets done until they hear the problem. Nothing gets done until that problem gets to the right person. So in as much as, as, as we can get that to the right person, and I say we, I'm a pastor for crying out loud. I, I don't, I'm not even sure why I'm here, but, but I, just, I got a good friend, and, and he happens to be president of the United States. So, so that's why I'm here. So I'm not, a, I'm not a huge problem solver in government, okay? Don't be emailing me anything. It will go right into my prayer bin. I'll be praying. I can pray for you, but I can't fix anything. But we do have, I mean, there are a number of us and more and more of us that know each other and that are in a network who are bound and determined um, that, that our problems could get fixed in this system. Uh, and I think we have the momentum. Uh, yeah. Ali. Uh, there, there is that uh, notion that I found profoundly destructive of clash of civilizations. And uh, sometimes it is being viewed as a clash between the Judeo-Christian philosophy and Islam. And uh, from everything that you were saying earlier, obviously you do not think along those lines. Yeah. But that notion is floated around. So my question is, how do you think that you can, you can help enlighten people's vision about that issue? That's a very good question, Ali. It's, it's, as, for those of you who don't know, Samuel Huntington wrote a, a very famous book, uh, The Clash of Civilizations. And, and in that, he said there are fault, um, lines. Di fault lines, divisions uh, between civilizations, religions, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that is our future, uh, to, to deal with those. Um, the counter narrative there, and the more powerful narrative is, no, I have a friend who is Muslim, and he would lay down his life for me, and I would for him. So there's no class of civilizations in my life. Um, um, and, and, and by the way, those of you, all of us come from a community. I don't just do this on an international scale. I do everything in my community with um, a, 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 a team of Jewish and Muslim and Catholic and, and Hindu and, and so on and so forth. We're multi-faith in our community because nothing will stop a off-handed critical um, comment. Um, some derogatory comment faster than, wait a minute, you're talking about my friend here. Uh, don't go there. And they're dead in their tracks. And so, and so our, our narrative has to be personal or um, if we don't have a relationship with someone of another, another faith or of another nationality, whoever's getting trashed at the moment, um, we need to also, we need to then say, you know, that's not what my faith tells me. Or that's not what my understanding of what will really be helpful. Um, and so we, we, need to, we need to be the ones who stop that narrative. Irene, last question. Just wait for the microphone one second. Uh, we are founded in the United States uh, for freedom of religion, to have it or not to have it. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, I would characterize the United States more, not that we are a religious nation, but we are a spiritual nation of many different kinds of spirituality. And um, the separation of church and state is still a, a very important part. What you have exp explained to us and what you are doing for our country, 
with your colleagues in, in your travels from the faith community is critical and so important and greatly appreciated. But I, I needed to say what I had. Absolutely, I'm, I'm in, yeah. I guess we have one more, time for one more question over there. Yes. The red shirt really helps, doesn't it? <laughs> Ma makes, her, makes her stand out. First of all, thank you for coming. Um, I'm a student, so it's really awesome to be here among all of these um, fellow Iranian Americans. My question is more um, asking you to advise us, because as Iranian Americans, many of us identify as secular. I think that's pretty obvious. Sure. <laughs> um, and we are inherently mistrustful of this Islamic regime. How do we overcome that? Can you help us? <laughs> Can you give us some advice? Because it's going to, and I'm sure it does, have a large role in the fact that Iranian Americans are not politically active or as an, are not as politically active as we should be. Yes. Now, when you say regime, the present regime, are you talking about uh, the present administration the in the United States? The, no, 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 the system. no, no. Okay. <laughs> the system. Okay. The, um, Okay, I got you. Uh, okay, I, regime is re, you know, it's a it's a well, it, it is a code word uh, that is used by some um, very conservative people in the United States to refer to P uh, President Obama and his administration. <laughs> it that, is. That's not what she was referring. It to. is. I, uh, no, and you know, but this is this is who I hang around. So, you know, that was the, that was the trigger that got pulled. Um, Oh, that's a bad analogy. Um, bad figure of speech. Uh, but um, I, I, I don't, I think that if, if, if you are a secular person, it's, it's, it means that you are a person who is open to what is needed to work, a comprehensive solution. What I was saying here is that just as things are, religion has to be a part of that comprehensive solution. Uh, because that's how much of our nation um, is, is, is wired or, is, or, or is oriented. That is how much of Iran is oriented. And so it doesn't mean you have to believe any particular thing. It just means that um, all elements that can be helpful and can be developed should really be engaged to do just that. Um, we are not in a place where we can discount anybody and say, you don't matter, uh, or you're not part of the solution, or you're a little bit more dangerous than I'm willing to deal with. Um, we're, we, and I've heard it several times uh, from the front um, as, as we've been here, um, um, even with you know, guys like Kirk, you still give it a shot, you know? <laughs> Um, you, 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 you know, maybe the answer is going to be no, but come on, you know, maybe it'll be, maybe, maybe you catch them on a good day. Um, the same thing, the same miracles thing is true. Miracles have happened. I know, <laughs> miracles. I'm, I believe in miracles. So, uh, so, so the point is that I'm not sure you have to change your belief system. I think that as a student, especially it's really important that you understand that probably everybody has a piece of the truth. Um, and the more you can see it in everybody and dig it out of everybody, the more of truth you're gonna have, okay? Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much for coming, sharing with us. We're very hopeful about what at the end of the day seems to be an embryonic channel that has been created. We hope that it goes very far because at the end of the day, I think everyone here recognizes there are plenty of elements in both countries and no, none of them can be wished away. Mm -hmm. There has to be a way to be able to connect, have that dialogue and coexist. And if you can help with the dialogue that you're having to connect with folks that we share the same culture with but perhaps have not been able to share the same language with, mm -hmm. then that is much, much welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.